again and welcome to another episode of the Pictish Saints Trail. I hope you've found our previous episodes to be both interesting and informative and that it's been has encouraged you to, to do a wee bit more research about the Pictish Saints, their lives, times and places that they have evangelised. Today I want to take a look at St Coleman who is uh, one of those groups of saints named Coleman, Colm, Colmock, Congan, Comgan, and all the variants that you can think of. They were prevalent in Ireland, Scotland and England and it's probably true that this has led to much confusion concerning their cults, lives and deaths and thereby resulting in much difficulty in knowing the truth concerning these saints as found in the various calendars on different dates from different countries. It would not surprise you, I'm sure, to learn that there are more than 130 saints of this name mentioned in Irish ecclesiastical records alone, and it's quite conceivable that their hagiographies have become intermixed. Although Coleman's feast day is noted in the Aberdeen Breviary on the 18th of February, he is also celebrated in the Irish calendar under the name of St Coleman of Inishboffin on the 8th of August and also the 13th of November. A lucky man with all these uh, days to, to celebrate his life and work. It's in the Martiology of Tala that St Coleman of Murray is celebrated, one of the few Pictish saints therein explicitly linked to Pictland. Alan Macquarie, the author, opines that it's possible that Coleman of Lindisfarne and Coleman of Murray are one and the same, as the Martyrology of Talx Coleman indicates the existence of a cult for Coleman of Lindisfarne in the north of Scotland. There is a, a link with Bill Helvey, which is a wee place located some 10 mile north of Aberdeen here in Scotland. It still doesn't explain, however, why the commemoration date falls on the 18th of February, unless there's some significance in it falling the day after that of St Finnan, who was Comer of Lindisfarne's predecessor to the Sea of Lindisfarne. So, let's have a wee look at Coleman, who is a monk of Iona, chosen to succeed St Finnan as the third bishop of Lindisfarne. During a period of much hype Christian controversy on our islands, as to the correct calculation of Easter. The Roman system of computation was adopted gradually throughout the church in the 6th century. However, it is said that the church in the Celtic lands were very reluctant to change their ancient method, resulting in occasions when the church in Ireland and Britain were celebrating Easter while the remainder of the church elsewhere were still observing Lent. So to bring about some uniformity, a synod was held at Whitby to allow advocates of both systems the opportunity of stating their views and presenting their cases. Coleman was not a very convincing orator, and the wily Bishop Wilfred produced convincing arguments for the acceptance of the Roman computation and it was finally agreed that this was to be the norm for the church throughout the land. However, it took many years before that reform was completely implemented. Coleman had great difficulty in bringing himself to give up the old computation, so much so that he resigned his see of Lindisfarne after ruling it for only three years and retired to Iona with 
taking with him the, the monks of Lindisfarne who held the same opinions and practices as himself. There is some evidence to show that Coleman spent a few years in mainland Scotland and it's said that he later founded a church in honour of St Aidan at Tarbert in Easter Ross. And this church was afterwards renamed in his honour, St Coleman's Church. And the Martiology of Aberdeen states that Coleman was perhaps buried at the early Pictic settlement at Port Mahomac, which name translated means Coleman's Port. We know that after a stay on Iona, Coleman finally returned to Ireland and founded a monastery at Innisboffin, an island off the west coast, initially populating it with the monks who'd accompanied him from Lindisfarne, taking with him most of St Aidan's relics. After this, an additional new foundation was made at Mayo for Saxon monks, known as the Mayo of the Saxons. Coleman oversaw both monasteries until his death at Innisboffin, where he is buried. Here's what the Venerable Beads, who lived from 673 to 735, wrote about Coleman in Book 4 of his Ecclesiastical Story of the English Nation, around about the AD 667. He tells us that Bishop Coleman, having left Britain, built two monasteries in Scotland, the one for the Scots, the other for the English he had taken along with him. In the meantime, Mo Coleman, the Scottish Bishop, departing from Britain, took along with him all the Scots he had assembled in the Isle of Lindisfarne, and also about 30 of the English nation, who had been all instructed in the monastic life. And leaving some brothers in his church, he repaired first to the Isle of High, which we know as Iona, whence he had sent, been sent to preach the word of God to the English nation. No mention here of the Picts, eh? Afterwards, he retired to a small island which is to the west of Ireland and at some, some distance from its coast, called in the language of the Scots, in his boffin, the island of the White Heifer. Bede goes on. Arriving there, he built a monastery and placed it in the monks he had brought of both nations, who not agreeing amongst themselves by a reason that the Scots in the summer season, when the harvest was to be brought in, leaving the monastery, wandered about through places with which they were acquainted but returned again the next winter and would have what the English had provided to be in common. Coleman sought to put an end to this dissension and travelling about far and near, he found a place in the island of Ireland fit to build a monastery which in the language of the Scots is called Mayo and brought a small bark part of it to the earl to whom it belonged to build his monastery thereon, upon condition that the monks residing there should pray to our Lord for him, who had let them have the place. Then building a monastery, with the assistance of the Earl and all the neighbours, he placed the English there, leaving the Scots in the aforesaid island. This monastery is to this day possessed by English inhabitants, being the same that grown up from a small beginning to be very large and is generally called Mayo, and as all things have long since been brought under a better method, it contains an exemplary society of monks who are gathered there from the province of the English and live by the labour of their hands after the example of the venerable fathers under a rule 
and a canonical abbot in much continency and singleness of life. As I've previously mentioned, we need to remember that Bede's history is written from his viewpoint, a viewpoint that all things English are perfect and anything else from other peoples is flawed. Hence the criticism of Coleman's original monastery where the Scots left the monastic enclosure in the summer, bringing in the harvest, looking after the animals and no doubt spreading the gospel as they went from place to place before returning to the monastery before winter, winter set in. You know, maybe these monks were the forebears of the friars, you know, the Franciscan friars and many more of those orders which were set up some several hundred years later. Or then again, maybe, maybe Coleman was an innovator in so far as requiring his monks taking vows of chastity, poverty, obedience and stability, that is, not moving from place to place and leaving others to set off in the, the great peregrinatio. The Aberdeen Breviary tells a more charitable story about Coleman, stating that he left Northumbria in 664 because of, quote, the envy of the English which was aroused towards him and false accusations, unquote, without any reference to the Easter controversies. And Macquarie goes on to advise that the arguments between the Scots and the English monks at Innsboffen happened only because they were unable to agree among themselves because of the difference in their way of life. Going back to that extract from Bede, we have evidence of Coleman working with a local heir to build a monastery. And he says, Thereafter arranging the monks residing there should pray to our Lord for him, who had let them have the place. Was Coleman establishing the monastic tradition of praying for benefactors? Was he again being an innovator? I'm not sure. Coleman was said to have a, a connection with Caithness and it was there that he founded a small chapel at a place called Old Grey, close to the sea and it's linked to the Ray Parish Church that was in use until 1739. You can find that, uh, if you like, replacement church still on the, the plot of land next to the coast if you go following the Caithness uh, Trail of Saints. So Coleman of Iona, Lindisfarne, Innisboffin and Tarbot was finally laid to rest in either Port Mahomac or in his boffin, depending on which story you choose to believe. Here we have a saint who is much more than a portrayal of an allegedly weak bishop of the misleadingly called Celtic Church, who caved into the Roman ways of Wilfred and his associates at the Synod of Whitby. Coleman, in reality, was a holy and humble bishop, an abbot, missionary, innovator, leader of men, and a successful negotiator with landed benefactors. A person, a saint to be celebrated. Make sure that you celebrate his memorial on the 18th of February. Wishing you blessed days and safe days ahead. Bye for now.